Post. It always first reminds post. me. Of, uh, first, oh yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. You got the there. Countdown first. always reminds me of Wayne's World. You remember that? And you ever seen Wayne's World? Yes. Excellent okay. party time. They're all confused. You don't say two or one. You know, you just give the number. And, oh, you don't say two or one. <laughs> anyway, we're off to a great start. Is that, is that is that because you don't want your audio to get picked up? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, how's everyone doing? Good. How's How's Vancouver? <laughs> we had three more of these atmospheric rivers pass through the neighborhood. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Crazy. Just madness. Yeah. So, um, two were not bad. The one that hit is is hitting right now. Uh, is dropping another probably hundred plus millimeters of rain over over twenty four hours. So it's yeah, it's been it's been pretty bad, um, but, but again, I'm completely like we completely avoided it. Just a fine, mild day of light drizzle here, and thirty kilometers south of us, and forty kilometers north of us, people are just getting deluged. So, yeah, incredible. it's it's crazy. Yeah. So you have like a microclimate there? What's the, what's the deal? Is it like well, something so with the mountains? These things or... come from they come from Hawaii. We call it the Pineapple Express, mm. and it's this big long. There, so now they're 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 coming up with the term. <clears throat> Yay! Yay! Sure. It, is it Stefan? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so these these atmospheric rivers come from, like, they start off in Hawaii, and they pass all the way up towards the West Coast, and they're very thin. And so they just hit like a like a bullseye at some point around mm. the, the West Coast of Vancouver Island. And wow. so sometimes we get it where, where I am, and sometimes it gets funneled into into the lower mainland into Vancouver and so on. And that's what it's been this, this time around. Incredible. It's, you know, you've got the, you've got the Olympic mountain range in the U S and then you've got the mountains on the Southern side of Vancouver Island that funnel it. So if it does hit, hit mm. that way, then it does get funneled in. And then on the backside, you've got the, the cascade, the cascade mountains, which will block it from going over the mountain. And so that's where the, the, the water really piles up. And it was, yeah, it's just absolutely nightmarish how much rain was falling in that, in that region. So, Great. um, so, uh, so Stefan's here, uh, people can't see him yet. Um, but you will be uh, joining us on camera in a second. There we go. And then being shifted around as Pamela well, engineers. My face is, uh... There you go. Now you're live. Now we can see. Okay, you. but I'm 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 seeing myself not quite centered. That would that's don't worry, Pamela's Pamela will fix that too. Uh, but, you know, I'm just uh, killing time while she uh, reorganizes. My the head is so big. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. What's going on with that, Morgan? <laughs> pull back from your camera a little bit, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we need. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. Great stuff. Fantastic. Quality, quality programming. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Alexander, we will talk with you for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then thank you for your time. And then you're free to close the, the rendezvous window and enjoy the rest of your evening. But thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pamela is still finishing off the, uh, the engineering here in the, in the background, the production. Uh, there we go. Perfect. Name... You're there. All right. I say we do it. Okay. Oh, now you got to stop. Now you got to stop moving. Wait. <laughs> there we oh. go. 
no, no problem. No problem. Awesome. All right. And oh, and the key question, do you have a copy of your book handy at hand? I do. I mean, like physically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can yeah, hold I it do. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go get that right now. All right, Just, all right. Uh, have it on. Yeah, that's... I, yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah. When you guys write your books, just remember that's that's like rule number one. Always have your book in arm's reach at any point. You so mean this thing? Wait, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, or or have my book at arm's reach. That's another. That's an even better approach, I think, Morgan. I like that one. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You always want to have your book at arm's reach, no matter what. Send me okay. your books, and I will feature them. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Someone give me a book deal. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right, here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about an ultra-hot Jupiter with a 16-hour orbital period. SLS lives, extracting oxygen from lunar regolith, a clear view of the Milky Way from New Horizons, the launch of DART, and a Mars rover update. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Nick Castle. Nick. Howdy. I was mentioning uh, previously that you uh, you have the fresh glow of a, of a man who's seen his first rocket launch. Yeah, it was pretty fun and literally pretty cool. That marine <laughs> well, layer was somewhat wicked. We'll 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 get into it uh, later on in the in the episode. But again, congratulations! It's uh, you know uh, they're they're awesome. <laughs> We've got uh, Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan, long time no see. And we got Dr. Alex Tichi. Alex, how you doing, Fraser? Wow, this is this is like a just a it's like a all doctors. I feel uh, under under credentialed today, <laughs> so I'll try to keep up with the rest of you with the with the crew of PhDs. Uh, but before we get into this week's special guest interview, I want to give a huge thank you to our friends, fans, the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They're really our executive producers. They call the shots. If you want to join this esteemed community, go to wshcrew.space. They'll hook you up. They'll give you all the information that you need and an amazing community. Talk about space and find more guests for the show. All right. Let's get into this week's special guest. We've got Dr. Stefan Alexander. Dr. Alexander, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. It's good to be here. Um, well, I'm, the, I'm amongst all these doctors, I see point out. I feel <laughs> under, under, you know. <laughs> what, did, did you realize that this was going to be a, yeah, a, a, a PhD defense for me? Wait. <laughs> oh, God. I still have nightmares about that. Seriously, literally, I, I have nightmares about that event. <laughs> um, actually, one of our, uh, one of our co-hosts, she live streamed her PhD defense, which was pretty no amazing. Way. That's bravery. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Um, anyway, the, the question I always ask people, who are you? What do you do? Oh, shoot. You sound like a Zen master or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, no. Be like water. Um, no, who no, are you? No, yeah. no, 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 that's a hard question. Okay, okay. I am a theoretical. Well, no, actually, I don't fit in anywhere. And, and I'm a theorist, but like I am too. I'm not specialized enough. So like I'm very broad. And so I work at the interface of no cosmology, um, fundamental theories like quantum theories of gravity, superstring theory, other approaches to quantum gravity, and how we can use that to learn something new about space. How about that? I uh, well, I, I I looked through your most list recent papers of the 133 that are connected to you, um, and I I see some themes. So you know, I'm sure we. I would can like to. I would like to. Maybe I would love to hear what what you see that as because. That can actually help me out because I'm fe I feel quite directionless these days. <laughs> well, I, I, what I see is somebody who's like jumping way out into the bleeding edge of cosmology and trying to figure things out. So, if that okay, uh, that's they, yeah, yeah, that's firmly situated in the bleeding edge of cosmology. Yeah, um, but I think that you know that's gonna be part of what we're. I think we should really be be talking about today. So, first, you have a book. Congratulations. Um, let us know the the title of the book and uh, so and you this get, is, get to show a copy. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, show a copy. 
You know, one of the things I'm realizing, the orientation, I got to put it in front of my face. Yeah, you got to put it right in front of your face for a second and then come back to it. Is it there? Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, there you it's go. Fear of a Black Fear, Universe. Fear of a Black Universe. Um, it's a, a, a homage to my, this rap group when I was a graduate, when I was an undergraduate in Philadelphia called I, Public Enemy. Oh, yeah. I love the Fear Public Enemy reference. And um, I actually saw them against, I think it was Rage Against the Machine and Public Enemy. In oh, concert. that's yeah, so yeah. cool. Um, yeah. So, um, but you got yeah, Chuck so, D to put a to give you a quote, right, for the book? Yeah, I can actually read. Actually, this is you're looking at the original um, copy. So the so Chuck D's um, basically says, "I take I took him into into the rabbit hole, um, and that this book is ultimately the best answer to the question, what is soul?" And I was just like, I thought James Brown answered that question. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah. but I, yeah, so mm -hmm. oh, I just, I mean, just to get Chuck T to 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 write a a, sub, a quote but, for your book is you know, that's career level right there. But here's what's interesting about that. So, what happened was my publicists they were like, the book is coming out. Um, you know, when is Chuck D gonna like give us a quote? Because traditionally, like, you know, um, we have some other authors out here that. And I've definitely given blurbs myself. It's just like, you don't really read the entire book. You just read enough and you're like, okay, I'm going to go. Actually, Chuck D refused to actually give a quote until he read the entire book. <laughs> and he had to reflect on it. And that's when he decided to give the quote. So that's oh, true. that's ultra, like, you know, props to Chuck D, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. He had to read the entire book first. So... You know, as I understand, and I apologize, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the book, but I watched. Uh, Me either. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Who reads their own book? It's madness. But I did watch your interview with uh, Dr. Brian Keating, so I feel like I have, uh, you know, a a respected interview. Uh, someone who I've talked to many times in the past had a chance, and so I would love to to talk about this idea of how physicists can sort of explore new ideas out beyond the boundaries of of what is currently established thinking and where the money is really flowing mm -hmm. and make progress and not be labeled a crank yes it's a it's a tight wire to to walk on and um tight rope oh yeah to walk on um and I would say that, first of all, I mean, you have to look at facts. I mean, history is provides in the history of science facts. I mean, when you look at Kepler, you know, back then when Kepler figured out the first set of equations to understand planetary motion, luckily for him back then, he had to be trained um, in music theory or Gap Galileo as well. I mean, they knew some music theory so that he used that as a tool um, as well as, you know, some ideas from, from Pythagoras and Plato. But basically, it, was, it wasn't enough to just have the traditional tools. And I think that's the point here. When people think about, like, um, ideas that are going to take us and get us to the next level, I'm not trying, in the book, I'm not trying to say that, you know, you need to have the basic um, foundations. And th but, the, and, but what I'm also saying is that that is not enough, mm -hmm. Right. It is not enough. If you look at some of the greatest, I was just reading up a lot about Grothendieck, the great mathematician. Probably you could say my friend Ed Frankel says one of the great, the great, probably the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. I mean, there were certain things that, like, about topology that you know for non-continuum spaces that he showed applied. I mean, he had to break the rules, but he had to master everything else to do that. So, in the book, I'm uh, part of what I'm saying is that I didn't say directly because I didn't put too much attention onto, it was an assumption that like anyone that's really interested in taking um, our, our knowledge base in physics to the next level, it's an assumption that you gotta know the scales. You gotta know how to, you know, you gotta know the basics. But it's not, what, I'm, what I was also saying is not, not, it's not enough. And the other thing I wanted to say there was, um, if you look at like, for example, electromagnetism, um, Maxwell's equations, which you know is a major part of the foundations of our technology. I mean, my cell phone here, Maxwell <laughs> equations. I mean, I don't need to go to a standard model. 
talk about the you know veracity of Maxwell's equations, but Faraday, Faraday's ideas, you know, of the invisible lines of force was woo-woo back then. It was mm -hmm. complete woo-woo, it was witchcraft. I mean, back in his days, you know, the idea of him is everything had for something to, you know, everything is very mechanical and the idea of an invisible line of force to explain, you know, magnetic induction, the experiment that he also did was seen to be laughable. It was stigmatized. He was stigmatized. He was called an idiot. He turned out to be right. So the point there is that um, it isn't to say that every crazy idea is going to be right, but we should not be afraid of the stigma and be afraid of being called names if you know that you're doing the right thing. And if you, and, you, know, if you, you do your due diligence to make sure that you got the skill sets in place, and you may not have it all. That's why Albert Einstein needed Marcel Grossman. You know, he didn't know differential geometry at first, right? So we need to work together in this project, right, of trying to get to the next level. Well, I, well, I, I mean, think you, you made a, a really important point there with knowing the basics, knowing the scales as in music. Like, I, like I'm sure you get a few emails a day, a week from people who have come up with a theory to explain the universe and and everything i get a, plenty of them and but that first step is the one they haven't taken it's the one they refuse to take because they think they don't need to which is to understand the current roadmap the current state of knowledge as well or at least as as well as can be to be able to speak their language to, to be able to to know where they're on the wrong track and that feels like that's the that's the that's your ante into the game, which I think many people are unwilling to do. But once you do have that ante in there, it's almost like people are are trapped by this, I don't know, prison of knowledge. I you know they they know too much now to go further, but they have all the tools to go further. That's right. So it's an interesting dance, right? Because you have one end of the spectrum of people, you know, in, you know, who are not willing, as you said, take that step to just know that some of the basic, like or all, all, all the foundations that that things have been built on that we know is true. Um, and then we also have people that, you know, they they you know they were the one they got the perfect this exam and they were this and da, 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 the number one and then they have all this they know all the stuff, but they there's a fear and that's where the fear of the black universe part of that title, a fear. To then say, okay, I'm gonna take a risk. I'm gonna say some something. I'm gonna use this these tools to 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 break some to do something because I know you know one of the great lessons I learned as a musician. Um, that's a longer story, but this great composer once told me, as an old much older person when I was younger, said, "You need to learn the rules so that you can break them." He was talking about jazz music, of course. He's like, "You need to learn the rules so that you can so that you can break them," and that was really like. I was like, I don't know, 20 years ago when I heard this, I was like, what the heck is this guy talking about? Yeah. But like, you know, but he was talking about music. Um, he's like, you need to master the rules so that you can break them. It's an interesting paradox because how do you know to break rules unless you know what the rules are, right? It's an interesting thing. So how do you think that that people who have learned the rules can build skill sets in kind of inject their mind with with new ideas be outside of their fairly narrow scope of understanding to be able to get some unique insights into the problems that they're working on humility i think that no matter how smart you are in a given branch i mean looking right now i'm, I'm in my living room and i'm looking i have a picture of my my hero in physics i have everyone we all have our gurus that's Leon Cooper. He was my first PhD advisor. He won a Nobel Prize in superconductivity. And um, I have a, an, I, ha I hired an artist six years ago to take, to do a, something, a painting of him. And it's in my living room. And I, there's a picture of him and he, he's looking at me in this picture because it's a reminder. Leon is a perfect example of this, that no matter, I mean, I always found it's true that the brightest physicists and mathematicians I've encountered I was hanging out with Mike Friedman the other last week in Berkeley, you know, the, um, the, the fields medalist for 
proven the Poincaré conjecture in four dimensions. And again, like, you know, you had all these other mathematicians and then you have like the top guy and he's just so open because, because, so let me just, so people like Leon, I'm talking about people, I'm, I can only speak from direct experience, not from these two individuals and others that I've interacted with, they're like real masters and they've accomplished real things, you know, Fields Medals and Nobel Prize. And yet they are always seeking information from outside, from outside their field of expertise. Yeah. Right? That's what I found interesting about the, those, those individuals is that, so there's a kind of like, yeah, you know a lot, yes, and you've ma you, you're like the king, but you're like, you're going to the other town to learn some new things because somehow you know that there's something beyond the horizon that, that uh, so that's, I'm not those people, but that's a quality that I've seen in the greats personally. Yeah. Um, so a lot of your work, as I said, you know, I, I, you say that you're kind of all over the place. I definitely see a focus on, on cosmology, large scale structure of the, of the universe. Uh, what, you know, where we are with kind of our cutting edge understanding of dark matter, dark energy, what is your, and I hate to use this term, your gut right now on what do you think is the, are the underlying characteristics of these mysteries today? I think that like, you know, I think that we, we definitely have a, we definitely, you know, I think Albert Einstein was, I mean, his picture of, you know, curved space time, the expect, I think all of that is definitely intact. No, no doubt about that. Um, because the predictions, I mean, those predictions have been, you know, um, you probably heard about the Hubble tension about mm -hmm. this issue that, that, um, the measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, um, since the universe had been expanding for, you know, about 13.8 billion years, we can, we have now means of measuring that expansion rate at earlier times and at late times. And, um, now the measurements are, be, are becoming so precise that now we're seeing this, we're seeing ten percent disagreements, and those ten percent can is actually asking for fundamental new physics. And yeah. right now we are completely, you know, there. Of course, we're very creative of coming up with models, but none of them really um, are satisfying. They're all contrived in some way, shape, or form. But you know, that's what people. That's what we're doing. Um, it seems that there's something deeper going on. Um, I don't know if it's going to like, mo you know, change the, the entire paradigm of cosmology. Um, but I think my gut, my gut feels it's something like this. It feels non-local. Um, and I don't mean non-local in any kind of woo-woo way. I mean, like in terms of like, how do we, what do we do with the paradigm of quantum field theory, general relativity, and like how that might connect to some deep questions um, about non-locality in the face of gravity and quantum mechanics. Um, because what you're doing is comparing s different time scales, but you see correlations on scales that, um, that if those correlations were there, they seem to be, you know, I'm now 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 I'm talking about things that I have no idea because everybody's lost on this. Okay, so yeah, you asked me to speculate. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say that my gut is saying that non-locality, but non-locality, and and with respect to reconciling things like locality, like you know, so Lorentz invariance, local Lorentz invariance, you know, the speed of light, causality. How do you keep that good stuff, but also leave room for non-locality, um, and um, not just only in quantum mechanics, but in, in classical mechanics, like, you know, in relativity. Um, it's, it's so a very, it's a really exciting time. And it's funny when I talk to physicists about this, this crisis in cosmology, they couldn't be happier that, that, that they're seeing the measurements at different phases of the universe coming up with different different numbers because it means there's a mystery it's something there's to chase down the particle physicists are looking on with 
sadness that every time they fire up the Large Hadron Collider, it produces exactly the answer that they're expecting. And they're not seeing the interesting weirdness out of the boundaries that they were hoping to find. There is, there is no interesting paths leading forward in the same way that I think the cosmologists and the, and the, you know, that astrophysicists are seeing at this point, which is, is exciting. It's tantalizing. You can, you know, every idea is back on the, is back in play, which is kind of wonderful. Yes. No, I'm no, I, this is, this is good for me. I mean, it's, it's like, otherwise you know, it's work. It's uh, you know, I, I have projects for my students now, so yeah, that's good. Yeah. They can go do the calculations. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Test out these hundred different ideas and see which one uh, gives you the, the better answer. Well, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, Dr. Alexander, uh, show off the book one more time and, uh, and then let people uh, know uh, where they can, uh, they can find out more if they want to, uh, to follow your work. Yeah. So the book is fear of a black universe. Um, let me also add that, um, you know, it's the, 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 the book is not what you think it is. The book is 90% about the new, the, the future of physics, the new ideas that's on the horizon. It's kind of like the manual for things, problems that I don't think my generation will be able to solve. Um, and that's kind of what is a, you know, a labor of love in that Wonderful. direction. And um, yeah, and you can get it anywhere. Um, it's on, you know, um, any, any platform, it's uh, pretty much available on all platforms, um, the usual ones um, and the usual bookstores. And um, it, it did win a couple of nice, interesting awards. So I'm very grateful for that. And I wasn't expecting it. So thanks awesome. a lot. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and good luck. And if you do figure out the true nature of the universe, would you let us know? Um, I'm more than happy to come back and let you all know even Perfect. before I do it. How about awesome. That? Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and, and good luck with all your work. All right, thanks for having me. All right. Awesome. Let's move on to the rest of the show. Um, let's see. Alex, I'm going to start with you. Uh, tell us about the ultra hot Jupiter. Yeah, uh, this is a pretty cool discovery. This is TOI 2109, I believe. It's a brand new discovery of a 16 hour orbit hot Jupiter. In this case, you can call it an ultra hot Jupiter. So this planet is going around its star. By the way, the star is larger than the, the sun. It's about one and a half uh, solar masses. It goes around once every 16 hours. It's nuts. So uh, it's been discovered by the uh, TESS mission. That's why it has that TOI uh, designation. Um, and it's about five times uh, the mass of Jupiter. And uh, they measure it to have a, a, a daytime temperature of something like 3,500 Kelvin. This is, they call this is the second hottest planet that has been discovered. Uh, that is so hot that they, they say that it's just tearing the molecules apart. You have molecular hydrogen in the atmosphere and it gets what they call dissociated. Just, it's just so hot that the molecules are just falling to pieces. You can't really have them. It's just, you know, atomic uh, hydrogen in the atmosphere. So, you know, these things are really cool. Hot Jupiters, uh, are, are kind of rare. When we first started seeing them, they're really kind of the low hanging fruit. You know, they're really big, uh, very massive, obviously, close to the star. So they're tugging on their star. Uh, we see them very easily. They have high transit probabilities, but they only amount to something like half of a percent of the, the planet discoveries that we found. But they are really cool uh, because for one thing, they're attractive targets for this thing that we call a uh, uh, transmission spectroscopy or transit spectroscopy, meaning that when the planet passes in front of the star, transits from our point of view, um, you can look at this planet in uh, this transit, this transit event in all different uh, wavelengths, and you can see how much uh, light is getting absorbed at all those different wavelengths. And so you can actually see what's, um, what's in the atmosphere. The other really cool thing about uh, hot Jupiters in particular is that when we look at the uh, you know, look at the starlight throughout the entire orbit. You know, again, it has a very short orbital period, so we can observe uh, the planet all as it goes around. And we get this thing called the phase curve. And phase curves are super interesting. I love phase curves. It's like looking at the moon or looking at Venus. You know, if you if you actually, if, if people are familiar with obs observations of Venus, you see Venus go through its, its phases, right? Sometimes it's like a like a new moon basically and sometimes you see it mm, almost full 
uh, you're seeing a different illumination of the planet as it goes around. So believe it or not, we can actually see this for exoplanets when they're super close uh, to mm -hmm. their star. So you can get more light from the planet as it swings around the backside. And you can see this in the light curve. Um, and then you actually also get to see what they call the secondary transit, which means that the planet is passing behind the star from our point of view, and you see another little dip in the starlight. What's really amazing about these phase curves is that you can uh, determine the albedo of the planet, how reflective uh, the planet is. We can also figure out um, the, sort of the day-night temperature differential here because, uh, you know, it's not we're not just seeing it in reflected light. We're also seeing... A thermal emission from the planet and so that uh, imprints itself in the phase curve and we can even see this thing called ellipsoidal variation and this thing just blows my mind the planet is so close to the star that what we are seeing is a, a, a tidal disruption of the star itself the, the wow. star is getting pulled in the direction of the planet and so what that means is that when the planet and the star is aligned we're seeing kind of a smaller uh, footprint of the star because it's uh, elongated this way. And then when it's at uh, elongation, we're seeing the planet uh, sort of, you know, broadside. We're seeing a sort of a fat side of the star. And so we see, you know, the star appears to get larger and smaller from our point of view. And so we receive more and less light as a result. And so you can see this as well um, in these phase curves. So this can't end well for the planet. <laughs> That's a, yeah, excellent point. They do think in this paper, they, by the way, I didn't even talk much about this paper. It's a massive paper. They've done tons of observations of this, uh, of this planet with multiple telescopes. Um, and, you know, there, there's this expectation that because this planet is so uh, close to the star, it will eventually spin into the star. And so they say that this planet's uh, orbital period will be shrinking by something like 750 milliseconds uh, per year, but if, which doesn't sound like a lot, of course, but, you know, add that up over a few million years and that becomes uh, quite substantial. So, yeah, the expectation is that eventually this planet uh, will spiral into its star. Right on. Cool. Awesome. Wow. Scary. Yeah. Uh, but it's, <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure you checked any moons. Uh, definitely. No, no. Moons. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Not for a planet like this. No way. All right. Fantastic. Uh, Nick. Let's talk about DART. Yeah. So uh, last week I had an extra special amount of fun. I got to go show up to um, a military base to watch a rocket launch. That's actually my first time seeing a rocket launch, which I'm sure surprises people that have known me since I've been obs obsessed with space basically always. Um, Congratulations! That's that is exciting. Morgan, Morgan, and I saw our first launch was Osiris Rex. Um, nice, uh, man! Like like four years ago. It's been a while now. Yeah, it was Sandy, and uh, wow, it was like a reunion. Almost. I brought my wife, and Chad <laughs> came, and we filmed it, and it was uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was uh, absolutely incredible to watch a rocket. So so that's that's it's fantastic. Pretty spectacular. This one's also a nighttime launch. So you really got to see a lot of details about what was going on in the changing. Like, I looking back on it, I should have expected to see this, but I didn't really. Um, the rocket plume changes color as it goes up. When it's in the lower atmosphere, it's coming out uh, oranges and whites. It's so incandescent, you can't really look at it. But when it gets higher and higher in the atmosphere, how that fuel is burning off, because it comes out a little bit extra rich, uh, changes. And it... Uh, develops this deep blue glow as it goes. Um, I also, uh, we were lucky enough to see a really big sonic boom cloud on this one that we then watched the rocket punch through and it left a donut cloud behind the rocket. I don't know why, but I always assumed those clouds just disappeared afterwards. But maybe it was just super humid or something. But it was really cool to watch this. Vandenberg's a tricky place to watch a launch because a rocket can just oh, yeah. disappear. Like you can watch a launch take, you know, rocket take off and then just disappear into the clouds and who knows what happens. Yeah, I went and saw the, see the Insight launch at Vandenberg a couple, a few years ago now, I guess, and saw nothing. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was like a night launch. I was excited, but it was kind of cloudy. And I brought my wife and was like, oh, rocket launches are so cool. You're going to love this. And, <laughs> and then we heard something for a little bit and then that was it. Didn't see anything. <laughs> 
How close can you get uh, when you go see something at uh, at that uh, launch site? It's a few miles. So they have a couple places they have you uh, view from, and it changes which one for where they decide to stick the press. That was the other really fun part is I've never been a credentialed member of the press before. Now I can't say that. <laughs> nice. Anyway. Um, we were quite a few miles. And, and, and what? And sorry, what was the? Uh, and who were you? Who were you there for? What? Uh, what esteemed publication were you representing? I was representing this little-known publication called the Universe Today. Um, oh, fantastic. And yeah, I haven't gotten I talked any to the big players from Space.com and you know a couple other journals that were they're like, what today? <laughs> they know, know they <laughs> who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't gotten any complaints about your behavior there, so I think you're uh, you're a keeper, Nick. <laughs> well, I tried so, Brady, to we should well. just talk to you if we if we need credentials to go see something in, in the future. Is that how it works? Yes, uh, he's always made the right. offer, and I've never known anyone who took him up on it. Yeah, plenty of people. Now you can't say it. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah, honestly absolutely. had no idea what to expect for this. Like, I didn't know if there was going to be an official presser beforehand. You know, with interviews in the room like you see in West Wing or, you know, something crazy like that. So I dressed up with a nice shirt and fortunately brought an extra warm jacket to put over that. I was way overdressed. Uh, now I'm still overdressed for the general crowd that was yeah, there. Yeah, a bunch of t-shirts, a bunch of people with t-shirts with cameras hanging out there. T-shirts, yeah, heavy necks. coats. Yeah, One guy brought an entire alien team. costume and was uh, trying to put on a serious face as he interviewed people uh, as though he was like from I don't even remember what planet he said. Uh, it wasn't a real planet as far as I know. So now you need to do your job. What was uh -oh. the mission? What is DART? So DART is the dual asteroid redirect test. So let's break down that name a little bit. Dual asteroid means it's an asteroid that's a dual system. So there's a parent asteroid, which is large, and tiny little asteroid that's orbiting it. We're trying to hit the tiny asteroid. And the reason why is because we want to see what that impact does to the asteroid. So the smaller it is and the tighter its orbit it is, the more chance we have to make a big change to it. So fundamentally, there's a debate over what exactly asteroids are. Are they broken off chunks from um, protoplanets, so that is planets that started to form and then got broken apart? Are they rubber rubble piles, that is literally loose gravel bits of debris that accumulated there, uh, somewhere in between? Are they protoplanets that just never really formed and we're seeing little chunks of early solar system that didn't do anything? And one of the big things that changes with that is how hard is this object? So if you hit it, does it act like a billiard ball or does it act like silly putty? So and that's one of the big things we're trying to figure out with this. And so what and is one the, the motivation? Components of the spacecraft. So how is it gonna how is it gonna perform its mission to give us this answer? So the heaviest component of the spacecraft is an impactor. Uh, this is a large mass that's going to uh, hit the asteroid actually head on. So their orbital directions are opposite. So there's as much energy as possible. Um, and there's what amounts to a CubeSat that's gonna be flying along uh, behind. And that's going to characterize in as much detail as we can reasonably get what's going on for that system, and then keep going off into Never Never Land until it right. runs out of power and dies. So no orbiter, um, no lander. No just... orbiter, no lander, no none of that. Just Although, um, as I understand it, a few years out, there's a European mission that is sending, um, I believe it's actually an orbiter, but I could be totally wrong because I didn't finish doing my homework. Mm. Um, it's going to revisit the system and see, okay, what happened? Like, did it make a debris cloud that now rings the parent asteroid? Did it make a giant crater? Did it just kind of stick there and nothing else went on? Like, how did this change as a system beyond just what happened to the orbit of the uh, little tiny moon? Yeah, so Nick, that kind of raises a question for me. Like, if that mission doesn't happen, oh, what kind of science can we get? I mean, you know, if we're not, how, how do you monitor what's going to happen to this, you know, tiny little satellite? If this uh, CubeSat so, you know, can look at it for a, you know, a couple of hours maybe and then, and then goes on its way. And then you know, otherwise we need you know, telescopic observations to figure out how the orbit has yep. changed. What's, what's the plan? So we can still use telescopes from the Earth to diagnose the system just the same way we have to identify this as a target for this mission. Mm -hmm. So we can keep monitoring how that tiny moon has changed its orbit. 
we can keep monitoring uh, the large asteroid. But did it change its rotational period? Did it change its orientation? Um, you know, all these kinds of bits of information we used to characterize asteroids from the ground, we can still do. Um, yeah. I don't know what orbital assets we could still aim at that. Uh, like, I don't know if this is something that's resolvable by Hubble, um, but there's that as a possibility as well. So I mean, if the European mission doesn't launch or doesn't successfully launch, we lose a ton of the detailed local context information, but we could still figure out, was DART successful? Yeah. Did we change the orbit? And in detail, how so? And yeah, so the goal uh, here is to is to figure out what... I guess, what impact can humanity have on the trajectory, the future trajectory of an asteroid? Can we no push intended, a dangerous sure. asteroid? Uh, what's going to turn into a direct hit 20 years down the road into a near miss? Yes. And ultimately, it, it comes down to the question of how much leverage do we have to change the orbit of something in space? I mean, there's always Hollywood's answer of nuke it into oblivion, but it turns yeah. out in reality... That doesn't work for a lot of reasons, unless the nuke pushes it to the side and it misses the Earth, which would be wonderfully fortuitous. Yeah, you but, nuke an asteroid and it just turns into a cloud of debris and that reforms under mutual gravity on exactly the same trajectory it had before. Now with radiation. <laughs> now with radiation, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those ironies of, yeah, where do we start explaining why this wouldn't work? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So the more we can figure out about exactly how how our tools can change what's going on with an orbit of something, like the more we figure out how well we can impact this to change its orbit, not just make a new hole on the surface, um, the more we understand, okay, how early do we have to identify an asteroid coming in to do anything about it? Um, what sorts of orbital tweaks are we likely to be able to manage? just gets us more data and how do we deal with this yeah yeah fantastic well congratulations uh thanks keep us posted you're now let us know when dart actually is successful and uh you can give us an update sounds good assuming they hit just think about like i mean think about the the physics involved the math to to hit a moving target to direct impact head on the moon of an asteroid um that far out in space with a refrigerator sized you know, impactor is this is a really fun project for people at home in Kerbal space program um <laughs> load up a custom mod where you've got an asteroid in solar orbit then put a tiny asteroid in orbit around that asteroid now launch something from kerman and hit it from solar orbit you didn't come into <laughs> orbit around the asteroid you hit it from solar orbit yeah that is some wickedly detailed math yeah yeah, yeah, amazing. What's the timeline? What when, when, when is the uh, uh, rendezvous? Any idea? Rendezvous. I've currently forgotten that information. It's about a year. Uh, it's next year. It's yeah. about a year. Yeah. Um. All right. So ah, Pamela let's... chimes in. It's September twenty second. Oh, there you go. Um, of next year. All right, let's move on. Morgan, which one do you want to talk about? Well, first, I think we should give people. The good news update about James Webb, which is it's probably not broke. <laughs> um, yeah, so we talked last week about the incident that NASA reported uh, in which the telescope suffered a vibration during mounting rocket, essentially. And that vibration was not supposed to happen. And so they paused activities in order to conduct four days worth of tests to find out sort of did anything bad happen. And as far as they can tell, the answer is no, um, which is good. That's the, that's the best answer we're going to get right now. Um, but we won't really know mm -hmm. until the thing gets out in space where we can't fix it. Yeah. I mean, as far um, as they can tell is they can't tell anything. Right. So there's a little over 300 single points of failure on the spacecraft, all of which are required to actuate successfully in order to unfold the mirror and the solar panels, uh, et cetera. Uh, Alex's re response there is about, about the one I think of most uh, astronomers who are not directly involved in, in the mission. And if you're like, your career depends on the mission, you're probably more like shaking in the 
corner. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, sort of, does not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. waiting to see. So, I think we kind of talked it out last week. It, this is good. Uh, this is the best of all options at this point. So, so huzzah! Let's let's talk about something a little more fun. All right. So let's talk about your other story. Yeah. So let, let's talk about breathing. I think we're probably all in agreement here that breathing is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right. now that, I try it every uh, day. Yeah. So, so now that we're trying to go back to the moon, we've got to figure out how to breathe there. And when we did this 50 years ago with Apollo, we basically just put in our backpack, literally all the air we needed and, you know, carried it with us as we walked around. Uh, but now we're talking about going long term. Uh, you know, NASA is planning to send astronauts on Artemis who will be there at, at least a week and potentially more than a month. And, and Russia and China have been making a lot of noise about establishing a permanent moon uh, base that would be occupied like the ISS. So so all the time. And the problem we have here is sort of resupplying that base in perpetuity. And so there's a lot of work being done by engineers to investigate uh, in situ resource utilization, which is the idea of basically living off the land. Uh, obviously, the land on the moon is maybe not quite as hospitable as the land here on Earth, but it actually has sort of surprisingly more than than you would expect. And, and the piece that I think has kind of leaped out to be the thing that people are most excited about is the idea of creating breathable air from lunar dust. Uh, and if I read off like some of the most common compounds in lunar regolith, it's silicon dioxide, aluminum, aluminum oxide, titanium dioxide, magnesium oxide. Now, actually, about 80% of all the major minerals on the moon are oxides. Hmm. And so that means there's actually a tremendous amount of oxygen locked up in the lunar surface. Um, now, the trick is to get it out. Uh, and we actually, the good news here is we don't need a lot because on average you breathe in about 800 grams of oxygen a day, which is, I don't know, to me, that seems sort of surprisingly low. And, and so we don't have to sort of move heaven and earth to make, make this happen. And so a lot of work's been done in sort of how do we get this oxygen out? And the reason we're talking about this now is because NASA has recently signed a contract with the Australian Space Agency to develop a lander that's going to go to the moon around 2025 wow. and actually test this out. And the technique that they're going to be using is based on a paper, uh, actually a series of papers that have been developed um, over the last decade uh, that talk about actually using chemistry to break oxygen free out of this. And what struck me, what, what I thought was so neat about this and probably why this mission is moving forward is how sort of easy it seems. Um, yeah. The idea here basically is to use electrolysis, which is basically, you know, shock the heck out of it <laughs> and break out the oxygen. And a European mission, an ESA mission, is actually going to try this on the South Pole with ice that's trapped in uh, the crater. So that's kind of the traditional way of doing electrolysis is water. But it turns out you can do electrolysis on anything that is conductive. Yeah. Now, I saw, rocks, yeah. the, sorry, I saw a picture a couple of years ago, maybe where they had this like little pile of metal that they had made from doing this process of electrolysis on simulated moon dust. And it's right. just so like, it's, it's cool. Yeah, it's so cool. Yes. It turns out that the lunar regolith is not conductive, but all you got to do is kind of mix in something that is and then shock the heck out of it. And the process is amazingly efficient. In these lab experiments using simulated lunar regolith, in 15 hours, they could extract 75% of all the oxygen in the regolith. Mm. About a third of that is was useful, like free floating around oxygen. And so you're talking you know, a quarter of a sample basically is oxygen you can breathe. If you need 800 grams a day, that means you only need a few kilograms per person per uh, day. And that seems sort of imminently attainable compared to some of these other lunar, other lunar mining things. 
So my question is, like, the plant is ultimately, I mean, you have to supply the oxygen for, say, a moon base or something like that. But then, presumably, it's still a little easier to cycle. You know, there's people are breathing out carbon dioxide and then do the regular filtering thing. Like, you know, we're not constantly importing new oxygen to the ISS, right? I mean, like, just, you know, sort of recycling the O2 is probably still going to be a big piece of it. Is, is it Absolutely. Is that fair to say? Yeah. It's not a perfect loop because not only do you have rust yeah. and things like that, but you also, you lose a lot with like airlocks and things like that. So mm. on the ISS, they lose, lose several kilograms of oxygen or basically every time they cycle the airlocks because yeah. kind of that's just how it, how it works. Uh, right. And so it's kind of like trickle charging a battery where as long as you can kind of keep up with the loss, you don't have to sort of, it doesn't have to be super, you're not doing a, a ton a day. Right. At, and you yeah. make, as Fraser was saying, you make all this extra leftover byproduct that turns out it just happens to be metal and aluminum and titanium and iron and all these things that would be useful for building stuff on the moon in the long term. Well, right. it's actually the reverse so, um, that like Andy Weir, he did his book Artemis, and he was saying that if you build structures on the moon out of aluminum that you mine out of the regolith, then you have way too much oxygen that you know what to do with that. <laughs> that you're going to have to like pump it into tanks. You're going to have to just vent it off into space. There's too much oxygen on the moon. If you're going after the metal. Right. And... Cause you only need a few, you, you know, you need again, a kilogram or something and you're not losing that much. Yeah. And every kilogram, you know, aluminum, uh, aluminum dioxide is one aluminum atom for every two oxygen atoms. So if, if you need 10 tons of aluminum to build your structure, well, now you've got 20 tons of oxygen. <laughs> yeah. Now you were mentioning that, but there's some spacecraft coming to actually try and test this out. Yeah. So NASA signed a contract with the Australian Space Agency to work with uh, private enterprise in Australia to develop experiment to test this. And it will fly to the moon mid 2020s under the Artemis umbrella uh, as a sort of a precursor mission to a future long term outpost. That's and in the said. same. In 2026, ESA will be landing at the South Pole, another in situ experiment to try this electrolysis idea on ice. Yeah. But of course, then you have to locate yourself where the ice is. And so if we can make this regolith idea work, that is sort of ideal because there's there's dirt everywhere on the moon. There's more yeah. dirt than, than you know what to do with. Yeah, totally. It's actually Fantastic. something I want to back up and amplify for a second. Like what's so cool about this is you're literally talking about breathing a rock. <laughs> you're taking a rock, you're smashing it really hard with voltage and pulling the oxygen out of the structure of that rock and saying, no, I want that. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah. I, I, the part that kind of excites me the most in, in space exploration is just this idea of in-situ resource utilization, you know, that, that everyone is so like thinking about how we're going to need bigger and bigger rockets that you know what comes after the super heavy and so on but i actually think we'll get to this point where where we're so good at making the stuff in space at the right location that we actually don't need to carry a mountain of cargo out of earth's stupid gravity well into space you use that stuff locally and and just send the humans and so our actual need for big rockets will, will actually come down i think after a while it's just just you just send Uncle the astronauts actually, to the lunar base. Uncle Willie had a great suggestion uh, about what to do with the excess oxygen. And right now, when we have electronic or electric propulsion ion engines, we usually use xenon because it's nice dense um, atom that we can kick out the back end. Well, if you've got a giant pile of oxygen kicking around, yeah, it's less efficient, but it's free. It's there. You can just burn yeah. it too as a fuel for for use an on, oxidizer on you still need on. the fuel and couldn't you like like people always talk about like you're going to use h2o you're going to use water and you're going to separate into the hydrogen and the oxygen but couldn't you if se if you separate the aluminum and the oxygen couldn't you then burn the aluminum with the oxygen and that would be your propellant i mean i don't know the exact that i don't know how easy thermite. it would be to ignite yeah <clears throat> well isn't that a isn't that a kind of reaction i feel oh, like yeah. yeah yeah it's very exothermic 
Yeah. Extraordinarily exothermic. Yeah. That's perfect. The more extraordinary, the better for your spaceships. Because if if hydrogen is at a is a thing that's hard to get a hold of, instead you're igniting iron or titanium and, and oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've got propellant. But anyway, some clever, uh, some really clever ideas. We're, we're running out of time. You guys, a couple of you had some additional stories, but I think we're going to have to, unless there was something like super urgent, I think we're going to have to just shift to the, to the end of the show. So, um, uh, Nick, you're to my right on my screen. So why don't you tell us what you're working on and where people can find out more? So what I'm working on, um, I actually just wrapped up my involvement in a lunar proposal uh, talking about trying to land in one of these sites that Morgan was just talking about. Um, and I'm moving on to what's next, which is usual grant proposals. But in the meantime, I'm uh, working on getting my concept of the wandering scientist up and running, which is where my wife and small child and I wander about the country from national park to national park and talk science everywhere we go. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that. That sounds that like a good gig. That sounds awesome. Yeah, sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds like a terrible gig. <laughs> I, well, I can tell you, here I am living in a trailer. Um, you know, manage your expectations. <laughs> the six month old is managing my expectations quite well. Yeah, yeah. Six month Wait, old. Whose idea was this? It yeah. sounds like someone forced Who brought the six month old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you leave the six month old, you know, back at home and just you and the wife go on the trip? Maybe that's probably not. Uh, I've watched uh, The Mandalorian. Oh. You know, having a baby in tow is the. Uh... <laughs> yeah challenging sometimes yeah little wolf and cub all right uh dr morgan renberg uh what are you working on yeah you can always check out some of my videos on scishow uh in fact i just submitted a video about breathing uh the lunar dust so this is an apropos uh week for this uh story so if you want to explore that in more detail that video will be out in a few weeks fantastic and if people want to follow you uh, I mean, go? you can follow me on Twitter, uh, and in the next few years, maybe I'll tweet once or twice. Uh, you can always <laughs> check out morganrenberg.com. Fantastic. Alex? Yeah, exomoons, all day, every day, except when I'm doing administrative stuff, which is all the time. Uh, so, yeah, but, you know, things are going well, and everybody can follow me on Twitter as well, at Alex Tucci. Fantastic. So uh, I am going to be interviewing uh, – did you see that story about the – that there's enough oxygen on the moon to provide oxygen for billions of people. All right. That's so, the same story. It's like yeah. all that moon dirt. So I'm interviewing the researcher behind that as well as the researcher behind this, this single purpose telescope to observe Alpha Centauri and search for habitable exoplanets. So I've got two interesting interviews coming up on my uh, YouTube channel. So, Obviously, I'm Universe Today on all the things and definitely come and check out more. So we've reached the end of our hour. Thank you uh, to all of my co-hosts for joining me this week. Again, congratulations, Nick, on uh, on watching your first rocket launch. Uh, I'm, I'm so jealous to see a night launch. That's amazing. Uh, thank you to our special guests who joined us today. Thanks to everyone watching us both on YouTube and on Twitch. And a special thanks, as always, to our wonderful uh, community, the WSH crew and specifically nancy does everything around this place graziano we couldn't do the show without you thanks to pamela for engineering and producing us behind the scenes thank you pamela i love being able to do the show without any uh without any hands it's great all right thank you everyone and we will see all of you next week